to welcome everybody. I'm Rachel Robbins. I'm the national chair of ADL Civil Rights Committee. Uh, and as a New Yorker, I would like to welcome you all to New York, uh, to the Javits Center, and to Never Is Now, and to this wonderful panel uh, called Leveraging the Law to Counter Anti-Semitism and Bias. Uh, so there we want this session to be very interactive, so there are note cards uh, on your chair or in the back. Uh, please do write down your questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, so we are joined today by three very, very distinguished panelists uh, whose full bios are in the ADL Never Is Now website, uh, but I will give a brief introduction to them. Uh, so in the middle is Professor Robert Katz, who's Professor of Law and John S. Grimes Fellow at the Indiana University McKinney School of Law. He graduated from Harvard College and the University of Chicago School of Law. He clerked for the Honorable Justice Breyer when he was the Chief Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. Uh, Professor Katz also served as director of the Harold Greenspoon Foundation and worked as a trial lawyer for the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Division. Uh, he researches how law propagates anti-Semitism and can be used to fight it. He's working with ADL support on a casebook entitled Anti-Semitism and the Law. It's the first of its kind and it's coming out when? <laughs> Kenahara, uh, <laughs> and he's preparing a law school course to accompany it. Uh, Professor Katz has successfully litigated cases defending the rights of inmates and same-sex couples, and he serves as president of his campus's Jewish faculty and staff council. Uh, next to uh, Professor Katz on his left is Britt Tevis, JD and PhD, uh, she is a Boston University Public History Postdoctorate Associate in Anti-Semitism Studies at the National Archives. She analyzes the intersections between Jews and American law. Her research has appeared in American Jewish History, the American Journal of Legal History, and the Journal of American History. And she's held fellowships at the Yale Program for the Study of Anti-Semitism at Yale University and the Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Katz is a theme you will see <laughs> through all, all our panelists. And last but not least, I would like to introduce Joed Katz. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're not related, they say. Uh, <coughs> Joette is a partner at Shipman and Goodwin, LLP in Connecticut, where she focuses her practice on appellate work, mediation, and investigations. During her 18 plus years as an associate justice on the Connecticut Supreme Court, Ms. Katz heard approximately 2,500 cases and authored 500 opinions. In addition, she served as, as an administrative judge for the state of Connecticut appellate system and as a judge for the Connecticut Superior Court. While serving as the Chief of Legal Services for the State of Connecticut Division of Public Defender Services, she co-authored Connecticut Criminal Case Law Handbook, a practitioner's guide. Prior to joining the firm, Ms. Katz served as commissioner of the Connecticut State Department of Children and Families for eight years where she was responsible for children in the department's custody and under its guardianship, uh, as well as overseeing the department's services for children and family throughout the state in need of assistance. Ms. Katz has also taught at all three of Connecticut's law schools and is an associate fellow of Trumbull College at Yale University. Uh, first of all, please join me in welcoming these three outstanding panelists. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Professor Katz. Good afternoon. Today I will talk about the crisis of anti-Semitism in the law school community. This crisis actually consists of two crises. The first one you know about, the rising tide of anti-Jewish hatred at places like Berkeley Law and elsewhere. The second crisis 
you likely haven't heard about, even though it is arguably more serious and entrenched than the first. I'm speaking about the law school community's basic incuriosity about the relationship between anti-Semitism and the law. This intellectual incuriosity borders on indifference. This might surprise you from a community whose sole job is to be intellectually curious. To prove that there's a problem, let the following facts be submitted to a candid world. One, nearly every law school offers courses on law and various forms of bias, including racism, sexism, classism, ageism, ableism, homophobia, xenophobia, and speciesism. By contrast, no American law school offers, offers a course on law and anti-Jewish bias. Two, many law schools run clinics that teach students how to use their legal skills to combat other forms of bias. By contrast, no law school operates a clinic to teach students how to combat anti-Semitism. Three, most law schools regularly host conferences on other forms of bias. By contrast, no law school has ever hosted a conference on anti-Semitism, with one notable exception. Four, many law schools run centers for the study of law and other forms of bias. By contrast, no law school runs a center for the study of law and anti-Semitism. Five, multiple textbooks called casebooks explore the law's impact on other vulnerable groups, including Asian Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, LGBTQ individuals, women, the disabled, the elderly, immigrants, even animals. By contrast, no casebook explores the law's impact on vulnerable Jews. Six, there are over 10,000 full-time faculty at American law schools. Of these, only a handful, perhaps a dozen, research the relationship between law and anti-Semitism. Seven, American law schools, the gatekeepers of legal scholarship, publish tens of thousands of articles a year. Of these, an average of 1.4 articles a year contain the word anti-Semitism in the title. Eight, the most important event on the Legal Academy's calendar is the annual meeting of the Association of American Law Schools, AALS. Over the past 13 years, these meetings have featured a total of 2,600 programs on a wide range of legal topics. Of these thousands of programs, only one has addressed anti-Semitism. It is also worth noting that the ALS rejected a proposal on anti-Semitism for its 2023 meeting. How hard is it to get an ALS program, a law review article on anti-Semitism? Let me put it this way. It is easier to get a Hanukkah special on Indiana TV on Christmas Eve. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, nine, law school programs for DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, work to make students from many vulnerable groups feel welcome and safe. At many law schools, however, DEI programs do not consider Jews to be a vulnerable group. As a result, they do not work to make Jews feel welcome, do not put Jews on DEI committees, or raise anti-Semitism awareness. Some even schedule diversity events on major Jewish holidays. By any conceivable metric, the law school's community, community's incuriosity about anti-Semitism is profound. Its failure to engage this subject is a great loss for our society and for Jews above all. Because of this neglect, law schools produce lawyers who don't understand anti-Semitism, can't spot it, and aren't trained to combat it. 
This absence will become more pronounced as law schools require students to take bias-related courses in order to graduate. Jews without anti law and anti-Semitism courses are thus shut out of a curricular space that is getting larger. Intellectually, this lack of legal scholarship on anti-Semitism is also a great loss. There is no work comparable to critical race theory, feminist theory, queer theory, Latino theory, and the like. Frontline practitioners in the fight against anti-Semitism are thus cut off from a valuable source of knowledge and guidance. Let no one doubt that there is a problem. What can be done about it? First and foremost, the law school community must acknowledge that Jews as a class are vulnerable and that bias against Jews is no less worthy of study than other forms of bias. They must accept their responsibility, both moral and pedagogical, to educate students about anti-Semitism. Second, infrastructure must be created to make the, law, the study of law and anti-Semitism robust and influential. A center would be a game changer by supporting research, hosting conferences and speakers, publishing a journal, tracking legal developments, operating a clinic, mentoring students, and providing them with a pipeline to internships and jobs at advocacy groups. Third, a casebook on law and anti-Semitism is sorely needed. Without a casebook to assign, law schools are unlikely to offer courses on the subject. Progress is being made on each of these fronts. Even as we speak, there is a law professor hard at work writing anti-Semitism and the law. The first casebook on this subject. You can read the table of contents and the online materials. The casebook will survey and synthesize topics related to anti-Semitism that law schools now cover either piecemeal or not at all. It will provide a legal history of American Jews and their efforts to obtain respect and concern through law. The case book is organized amount, around American Jews' five enduring aspirations for U.S. law. One, legal equality. Two, freedom from anti-Semitism in society. Three, freedom from state-supported Christian supremacy. Four, respect for the human rights of persecuted Jews abroad. And five, respect for the collective rights of the Jewish people. In addition to supporting a course, this casebook will be the basis of a continuing leg legal education courses, such as the one I am developing for the ADL. It will be a unique resource for scholars interested in researching the subject. Lastly, I hope it will be of interest to a general audience. In other words, pre-order your copies now. <laughs> the ADL is supporting the casebook in many ways, including through research assistance and feedback on drafts. Steve Friedman, ADL Vice President of Civil Rights and Director of Legal Affairs, is writing the foreword. The ADL has made me a senior research fellow at its Center for Anti-Semitism Research. In all these ways, the ADL is signaling to the law school community that anti-Semitism is worthy of its attention. Most importantly, the ADL is partially funding research leave to allow me to work on the casebook full time. With additional funding, I can complete it by the end of 2023. In law professor years, that's practically next week. <laughs> Without additional funding, however, it will take considerably longer, and this will in turn push back the timeline for achieving everything I've discussed. If you agree this casebook is overdue and want to fast track it, please contact me. You can find my, my information in your materials. To build infrastructure for this field of study, I'm collaborating with two colleagues, Professor Diane Kemper and David Schraub, to organize the Law versus Anti-Semitism Conferences for scholars and practitioners working in this area. The ADL is a major sponsor of these conferences. The first such conference, where Britt presented, was held in March 22 at my institution. It featured 50 speakers and attracted 200 registrants including lawyers seeking CLE credit. You can find a link to the conference in your materials. The second conference will be held at Lewis and Clark Law School 
in Portland in March 2023. You can register for it in your materials. We are honored to have Steve Freeman as keynote speaker at that conference. In, 20, in February 2024, the third iteration will be held in Miami at Florida International University College of Law. Concerning diversity and inclusion, Jewish faculty at several law schools have been working with DEI administrators to make them more welcoming to Jews and raise anti-Semitism awareness. The faculty, myself included, received invaluable aid from Dr. Miriam Elman, Executive Director of the Academic Engagement Network, and Naomi Greenspan, Director of its Initiative to Improve Campus Climate. The AEN, incidentally, is also supporting the Law and Anti-Semitism Conferences and my casebook project. To be intellectually incurious about something is to believe that it is not worthy of your sustained attention. That is exactly the law school community's stance concerning the legal aspects of anti-Semitism. They simply do not find it interesting. And every day, the social costs of their incuriosity mount. Because this indifference is so deeply entrenched, it's an open question whether law schools can solve their crisis on their own, or whether they'll require outside encouragement and pressure. By coming here today, I am quite literally speaking out of school. I am, in a way, going over some heads and appealing to a higher authorities. By higher authority, I mean people with two indispensable qualities. One, they understand that anti-Semitism is not only interesting, but imperative. And two, they might be willing to persuade others as well. For this reason, I encourage you all to reach out to people in the legal academy who are in a position to make changes. And if you know someone I should be talking to, be it a dean or a donor, I need to talk to you. I look forward to doing so. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Very, very interesting uh, picture, and we're so s delighted that you are doing the work you're doing. Uh, let's hear from Britt. Thank you. So we're gonna jump from uh, the very present to the past. As you heard, I'm a historian. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm accustomed to attending academic conferences. I'm accustomed to attending academic conferences where the audience is much, much smaller, so I am super jazzed right now. This is very exciting for me. Uh, today I'm going to discuss a pretty well-known phenomenon, uh, which is the exclusion of Jews from places of public accommodation, and specifically hotels. Between just after the U.S. Civil War and around the 1970s, Jews were quite frequently e excluded from hotels, resorts, inns, uh, because they were Jewish. And in returning to this history today, I wanna emphasize how the law has acted as both a sword and a shield in the effort to quell anti-Jewish discrimination in the United States. And I also wanna highlight the, the number of approaches that Jews have taken to grappling with anti-Semitism and the law. So I'm gonna share just a, a, a few historical anecdotes to do that. The first is called the Seligman Affair, and it's a pretty well-known episode from 1877. Uh, in May of that year, uh, a, a well-known Jewish banker went to Saratoga Springs to the Grand Union Hotel, uh, where he had been vacationing for quite some time and uh, tried to rent a room, and he was told that he uh, was unwelcome there because he was Jewish. Now, Seligman was a pretty well-known man because he was a banker, uh, and that's event because of that made made national headlines it was in the newspapers all over the country and even abroad and in the newspapers uh, <coughs> the newspaper headlines read civil rights in peril civil rights for the Jews the Jews and civil rights uh, a Mississippi paper said Hilton who is the manager of this hotel 
is in direct defiance of the established law of the United States. One Jewish writer argued that Jews excluded from hotels were duty bound to invoke the law for the vindication of his rights. A Hilton sympathizer wrote to the New York Times saying, what person, what right has one portion of guests at any hotel to deprive the other of all comfort and quiet on the acknowledged Christian Sabbath. So late 19th century Americans understood this exclusion I in legal terms for a number of reasons. The first was that there was a long-standing common law precedent concerning innkeeper's obligations to provide accommodations to guests who could pay the going rate. Uh, the law recognized that travelers refused accommodations would likely face difficulty securing alternative lodging, and this was thought of as a public service. Refusing to receive or provide for a guest was an indictable offense. New Yorkers and, and the country understood this as a violation of Jews' civil rights also because of the 1873 civil rights statute here in, uh, in New York, which prohibited exclusion of citizens from places of public accommodation, such as inns, theaters, and schools, on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Of course, that law was passed in the wake of the Civil War as a part of Reconstruction. And that that's leads me to the third reason why people understood this to be a civil rights violation, which was because of the context of Reconstruction and the Federal Civil Rights Act passed in 1875, which also included a section two, which said that uh, allowed victims of discrimination to sue in private action for up to $500 uh, for uh, and deemed eligible violators uh, uh, subject to a thousand dollar fines and up to a year of uh, imprisonment. Now given the circumstances you might have expected that Seligman would sue Hilton for violating his civil rights and his lawyer Edward Lauterbach was extremely excited for him to do so. He really thought this would be a way to assert Jews rights in court publicly. But that is that very reason why, in fact, Seligman did not sue. And this leads me to the first form of reaction to encountering anti-Semitism in the law in the United States, which is to remain silent. This is actually one of the major methods, the major ways that Jews have grappled with encountering anti-Jewish discrimination, which is to avoid bringing any attention to these episodes, hoping that they might just go away. Spoiler alert, they do not just go away. <laughs> So the second incident that I want to sh share with you today is about, uh, the second approach Jews have taken is about passing legislation. Passing legislation as a way to uh, uh, counter anti-Semitism in the law. In 1879, there was a repeat episode of the Seligman Affair called the Corbin Affair, in which a hotel owner and railroad owner in Manhattan Beach said, I'm not gonna allow Jews to come here um, and he, he used all the same reasons that Hilton gave, and out Edward Lauterbach once again swooped in and said, great, let's sue, and the uh, Jewish community at the time and its leaders said once again, no, we don't want to we, we bring a lot of attention to this event, let's do nothing. Um, but there was a, uh, uh, one Jewish man who was outside of this, this, this uh, larger Jewish leadership named Jacob Seebacher, he was actually the first uh, Jew elected to uh, New York State office in the United States, and he passed in 1881 a civil rights law that was supplemental to the 1873 law. The press covered this as being a civil rights bill for Jews, uh, and this was his response to, to basically a repeat episode. There's another uh, great example of Jews advocating and lobbying and pushing through legislation uh, having to do with public accommodations, and that happens in 1913. Uh, once again, Edward Lauterbach and another civ Jewish civil rights lawyer named Louis Marshall pushed through a law that outlaws discriminatory language in advertising. In 1883, the 1875 Civil Rights Act is struck down by the Supreme Court and uh, the Supreme Court says, actually, discriminating in places of public accommodation, such as hotels, that's fine. That's private. That has nothing to do with the state. You hotel owners, you go ahead with your private actions. That's fine. And in the wake of that, we saw a huge spike in discriminatory advertising in newspapers. The New York Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, 
on and on and on and on, would have advertisements that say no Hebrews, no Hebrews, no Hebrews allowed, Hebrews not wanted. This language also appeared in brochures for, for travelers all over the country. The language of Hebrew, of course, was, was a gesture towards the conceptualization of Jews as a distinct race uh, at the time, which is happening in the late 19th century. So this language uh, is proliferates, and in response, Jews pass legislation that outlaw that type of language, that outlaw the use of no Jews or no Hebrews. And in response, hotel owners they drop that language, and they start printing ads that say, Gentiles only. <laughs> <laughs> and so the whole thing, it's like whack-a-ball. The whole thing starts again. More legislation. Okay, hotel owners may no longer use Gentiles only. And the hotel owners say, okay, we won't. And so what appears? Restricted clientele. <laughs> that is the new language. And so this is a game, legislation in other words, is, is only a temporary fix and needs to be repeatedly pursued in order to serve as a, as a useful solution. The final way that Jews have approached uh, encountering discrimination in public accommodations with the law is to, on rare occasion, sue. This no, mostly happens through individuals, not through larger organizations, and it is, uh, it's probably the least common of the three solutions. Silence being the most common, uh, and perhaps the easiest. Uh, legislation being the second most common, obviously pretty time consuming to get legislation passed. And finally, uh, also time consuming and the least common, pursuing lawsuits. By and large, discrimination in hotels has waned significantly since the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But I don't want anyone here to think that we're just uh, you know, on a march towards progress and this is a problem of the past. Uh, not, to, not to end this talk uh, on, on, a, on a negative note, but it is important to know that uh, there are movements afoot that, that desire to use the law right now to in fact ban Jews from places of public accommodation. A survey done in 2019 in fact found that uh, over uh, something 20% of Americans thought that, that, sh that small business owners should have the right to refuse to provide products or services to Jews if it, if it violates their religious beliefs. In other words, people are trying to now use the First Amendment as a reason to legitimize excluding Jews from their stores, hotels, etc. So this is something to be aware of and, and uh, perhaps redeploy uh, solutions of the past to address this problem. Thank you very much, Britt. Uh, and now we'll turn to Justice Katz. All right. All rise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't kidding. Even, even my own husband didn't stand up. <sighs> <sighs> All right. <laughs> yeah, really, come on. All right, so um, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit Debbie Downer if this wasn't bad enough. Uh, you know, we were listening this morning about, obviously, all the atrocities uh, and, and horrific things going on in this country, certainly, and elsewhere, uh, to Jews. But what, what Christopher Ray commented on, and Miriam Elman also commented on, is what I want to comment on, and that is, let's not forget First Amendment, and in fact, that's how our organizations started. So going back a little bit, I'll leave that to our academic historians, but no, no, that's fine, I'm good, thank you. Um, but, no, no, it's, it's, thank you, I appreciate it. Good, thank you so much. Uh, but let's, let's remember what the other side of these conversations really is about, and that really, to me, is the First Amendment protections. And they extend to ideas that are intellectually indefensible and to speech that is morally obnoxious. Okay, so that's a given. The ADL espouses robust protection for freedom of speech, and we heard that and we were reminded of it again this morning. Now, at the same time, we have to appreciate that words can inflict pain and suffering upon the innocent and can even threaten the physical safety of targeted persons and groups. 
Today, the struggle against hate speech, that's what it is, extends to new and emerging forms that such speech has taken, such as extremist websites and cyberbullying, by way of example. So while we don't want government intrusion into speech, importantly, we have to recognize that the right to free speech is not absolute. It's a balance. Everything is a balance. In matters of defamation, copyright, patent protection, obscenity, commercial speech, incitement to violence, child pornography, and true threats, the right to free speech can certainly be curtailed. Specific causes of action prohibit the expression of harms to reputation, outrageous speech, theft of intellectual property, pornographic depictions of children, just to name a few. So although taken literally, the free speech clause appears to be absolute in its rejection of restraints on expression, court doctrine clearly allows states to place certain limitations on the use of language. Recognition that incitement, false advertising, and a variety of other categories can be restrained in a civil society without violating the Constitution is a testament to Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' assertion that the First Amendment, and I quote, cannot have been and obviously was not intended to give immunity for every possible use of language. And as Robert Post at Yale puts it, quote, the values served by the First Amendment, not simply syntax and semantics, come into play in free speech analyses. So there are trade-offs. There are trade-offs to limits in protection of speech that allow certain content regulations. Examples are abundant. Some audiences value the dissemination of terrorist dogma. But when speech becomes support into advocacy for harm, public safety will outweigh the value of such speech. I'd like to turn to that consideration now because, frankly, that is where I have lived, first as a public defender, then as a judge, a justice, and DCF commissioner. I, along with many other public officials, have been the recipient of what we call hate speech. In some instances, there have been prosecutions, while others are still under review and scrutiny. Very often, the crimes of threatening and breach of peace are the ones that are implicated. Now, threatening is easier to understand, and I'll, I'll discuss this a little bit more later if there's time. The First Amendment permits states to restrict true threats, what, what we call true threats. And these encompass those statements through which the speaker means to communicate a serious expression of an intent to commit an act of unlawful violence to a particular individual or group of individuals. There are also subsections of statutes defining breach of peace that include actual physical conduct or threats. Every state has its own penal code, and I won't belabor uh, the point with all the different subsections, but there are subsections of those statutes that do specifically prohibit speech that includes actual physical conduct or threats. But what I want to turn to for the moment is breach of peace that involves pure hate speech, speech that is unaccompanied by any physical conduct or actual threats. That can be a lot more complicated, and it's where many of the cases, frankly, land. So when a defendant is charged with breach of peace based simply on verbal statements, the first question is, do the statements at issue deserve the protection of the First Amendment? That's, that's the first question, and that's the visceral question, frankly. Despite what is often patently offensive and objectionable language. If they do, then they cannot serve as a basis for a conviction. So in other words, language that is allegedly abusive language, which is one of the terms used in the Connecticut Penal Code, nonetheless may be entitled to constitutional protection. The constitutional guarantee of freedom of speech requires that the breach of peace allegation, quote, be confined to language that under the circumstances of its utterance constitutes fighting words, those that by their very utterance inflict injury or tend to incite an immediate breach of peace. And that's where the breach of peace comes from. This means that in any such case, the state is going to have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt in the criminal case 
that the defendant's words were likely to provoke an imminent violent response under the circumstances in which they were uttered. Because in such cases, a defendant's free speech rights are implicated, obviously, several additional principles will govern a court's review of the question of whether the conduct is criminal. So even when we're looking at threatening, going back to threatening for a moment, to ensure that only serious expressions of an intention to commit an act of unlawful violence are punished, as the First Amendment requires, the state must do more than demonstrate that a statement could be interpreted as a threat. When a statement is susceptible of varying interpretations, at least one of which is non-threatening, the proper standard to apply is whether an objective listener, under all the circumstances, would readily interpret the statement as a real or a true threat. Nothing less will suffice. And to meet this standard, the Connecticut Supreme Court is, has indicated that the state has stated, rather, is has stated, not as indicated, clearly stated, that the standard the state is required to present evidence demonstrating that a reasonable listener familiar with the entire factual context of the defendant's statements would be highly likely to interpret them as communicating a genuine threat of violence rather than protected speech, however offensive or repugnant. And I can give you some examples of that later. But let's go to breach of peace because again, I want to return to words, just words and words with no action and words with no threat. So with a breach of peace, the question is, do the words by their very utterance inflict injury or tend to incite an immediate breach of the peace? So remember, we're focusing on the listener and what's the conduct of the listener going to be? More than 75 years ago, the United States Supreme Court in Szaplinski versus New Hampshire held that, quote, goddamn racketeer, close quote, and quote, damned fascist, close quote, were epithets likely to provoke the addressee to retaliate violently, thereby causing breach of the peace. So while the first although the First Amendment protects most speech, no matter how detestable or odious, the Chaplinsky Court held that the protection does not extend to the extremely narrow category of words that, quoting, have a direct tendency to cause acts of violence by the listener, the person to whom individually the remark is addressed. In recognizing the fighting words exception to the protection ordinarily afforded speech under the First Amendment, the Chaplinsky Court reasoned that such words, stop, excuse me, no, thank you, overruled. <laughs> no, you may not. Questions, thank you. We'll get to questions. And for those of you who really have questions, happy to entertain them after this panel is concluded. Can, can we just ask the staff to select the questions we gave them? Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. So, in recognizing the fighting words exception, which is where I was, to the protection ordinarily afforded speech under the First Amendment, the Chaplinsky Court reasoned that such words comprise, quote, no essential part of any exposition of ideas and are of such slight social value as a step to truth that any benefit that may be derived from them is clearly outweighed by the social interest in maintaining the peace by preventing the immediate incitement of violence. Again, remember, preventing the immediate incitement of violence. Now, it should now be crystal clear that there are no per se fighting words because words are likely to provoke an immediate violent response when uttered under one set of circumstances, but they may not be likely to trigger such a response when spoken in the context of a different factual scenario. Consequently, whether words are fighting words necessarily will depend on the particular circumstances of their utterance. The fighting words concept has two aspects. One involves the quality of the words themselves. The other concerns the circumstances under which the words are used. 
This contextual approach is also a logical reflection of the way the meaning and impact of words change over time. While calling someone a racketeer and a fascist might naturally have invoked a violent response in the 40s when Szaplinski was decided, those same words would be unlikely to even raise an eyebrow today. Indeed, due to changing social norms, public discourse has become much coarser since Szaplinski was decided, such that today there are very few and combinations, I think, of words and circumstances that are likely to fit within the fighting words exception. And in the now, having said that, the court continues to breathe life into the fighting words exception, and in more than 75 years since Szaplinski was decided, the United States Supreme Court and certainly the dictates of social norms have diminished the scope of its applicability, and I would point you to um, Erwin Chemerinsky's article in, in the Harvard Law Review from 1993, but nevertheless, the court has never disavowed the doctrine and on occasion has referred to it as one of the very few historic exceptions to the First Amendment's prohibition against content-based restrictions on speech, and I'm happy to provide citations if anyone's interested. So against this broad jurisprudential backdrop, courts have sought to identify the kinds of considerations likely to be relevant in determining in any given case whether the words have constituted unprotected fighting words. The requisite con contextual analysis examines the actual circumstances as perceived by a reasonable speaker and addressee to determine whether there was a likelihood of violent retaliation. What factors will the court consider? Well, the manner and circumstances into which, under which the words were uttered, the situation under which the words were uttered, and whether they were preceded by a hostile exchange or accompanied by aggressive behavior will bear on the likelihood of, of such a reaction. A proper examination of context al also considers those personal attributes of the speaker and the addressee that are relevantly, I'm sorry, that are reasonably apparent because they're necessarily a part of the objective situation into which the speech was made. This entails age, gender, race, and status of the speaker. Indeed, common sense would seem to suggest that social conventions, as well as special legal protections, could temper the likelihood of a violent response when the words at issue are uttered by somebody less capable of protecting himself or herself, such as a, a child, someone who is frail, elderly, or disabled. Remember, the speech has to be of such a nature that it is likely to provoke the average person to retaliate. But when there are objectively apparent characteristics that would bear on the likelihood of such a response, Many courts have considered the average person with those same characteristics. Those courts have taken into account, again, age, gender, race, by way of example. Now, I'm gonna conclude with two other examples. I understand there's time constraints, and so I will do my best to get through this, but I think this, this puts it in perspective. Because the, the words and the exception is really concerned with the likelihood of a violent retaliation, it properly distinguishes between the average citizen and somebody who, it, for example, carries with the expectation of exercising a greater degree of restraint. So, for example, a police officer. That's not to say that police officers should be doormats and have to withstand anything, but nevertheless, they are uniquely situated, and so courts will look at them as having a particular area and level of expertise for purposes of questioning retaliation. So again, fighting words is not concerned with creating symmetrical free speech rights by way of establishing a uniform set of words that are constitutionally prescribed. Rather, the fighting word exception is intended only to prevent the likelihood of an actual violent response. So I think the, my point in all of this, and I could go on belaboring this for as much time as anybody would give me, the point is that we all hear speech and we're all offended by it and we all think that it somehow has to be illegal. And the point that I'm trying to make is that, not so fast, we still have free speech, it is still, a, it is still sacrosanct and constitutionally protected, 
And before any court is going to venture into determining that somebody has committed an actual crime for which they will face imprisonment, there is a very lengthy analysis that gets conducted to really see whether or not we are talking about fighting words. Again, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. It seems like time has really expired. The only other point I would make is, in contrast to what we were talking about this morning on the Berkeley campus, the point I would make is that what's currently going on co on college campuses, I think students, we heard this morning, obviously, about the vile speech that goes one direction. But what I am more concerned about is what I think is going on on campuses where I see there is really almost a hostility to the idea of free speech on campus. Students actually, in my estimation, want campuses to stop offensive spe speech and trusted campus officials should have the power to do so. And I would point you to a 2015 survey by the Pew, Pew Research Institute that says four in 10 college students believe that government should be able to prevent people from publicly making statements that are offensive. Really? The most recent studies demonstrate that students continue to wrestle with how best to value free speech and inclusivity, with more than half of them valuing diversity and inclusivity above free speech. And more than half support bans on hate speech, almost a third supporting restrictions on offensive speech. So rather than appreciating the traditional role in the university as the quintessential marketplace of ideas, students, alumni, and the public frequently appear to believe that whenever a school tolerates offensive speech, the university is endorsing those viewpoints. And frankly, I find this phenomenon particularly disturbing. So thank you for your time this morning. So, so th thank you, thank you very much, Justice Katz. Uh, we have a lot of questions and not an enough time, but Professor uh, Justice Katz has, has offered, and, and Professor Katz have offered uh, to stay around afterwards and, and deal with any questions that we can't answer. So one question is, with respect to assessments of fighting words, is there data available that tracks the accuracy or inaccuracy of such predictions of dangerousness? Are such assessments often accurate? Mm -hmm. Who wants to take that one? Um, I mean, there's Mike, Mike. I mean that, the, first of all, there are two parts of the hate speech. One is, is words that by their nature inflict injury, which seems to be more you know, what we're talking about here. I mean, the other prong we have is going to incite violence. That is very conditional on who you're speaking to. If you're speaking to a disabled person, what's the likelihood that they're gonna respond with violence, as opposed to a woman, as opposed to a professional wrestler? So, I mean, it's not a great test. Yeah. Uh, another question is, do you think the Chaplinsky decision would be upheld by the Supreme Court? Well, as, as recently as 2011, the court, you know, obviously things Different have changed, court. absolutely. I, I do think, I, I do think they would still uphold it. Um, I don't think it's, and quite frankly, because I don't think it's really something that the court cares that much about. So I, I think there'd be no reason, frankly, and I don't know if you agree or disagree, I don't see them overruling the concept of fighting words. They may. They may tweak it a little bit, and certainly depending upon the facts and circumstances before them and the speech at issue, they might refine it a little bit, but I don't see them uh, reversing. Well, the point of the fighting words doctrine is that this isn't really speech. I mean, this is action, so it's not gonna, so, you know, the point is this is beyond First Amendment protection. So I think it would still be good law. So a, a follow-up question is, uh, would the words, Jews will not replace us in the context of Charlottesville be considered fighting words in court? Um, I mean, I think we start with, it depends if you're, if you're, there's a crowd located outside a synagogue and they're bearing torches and, you know, someone says that to them, is that gonna provoke 
them burning the synagogue, okay, you know, then that then that's going to be problematic, right? I mean, if it's just um, but if speech. you were you're a Jew in Charlottesville when the guys were marching down, right? So I mean, putting aside whether it's going to provoke the violence, you have that other part. Does it by its nature inflict injury? And that is underdeveloped. We actually that's just sort of language that sits in the. Uh, in, in that Apichaplinsky decision that we don't know what's going to happen to it. The courts could revisit it and make it robust or it could just lay there fallow. So, again, going back to facts and circumstances, uh, there was a case from 2015, the Tenth Circuit reversed a district court because it said the district court incorrectly concluded that defendant's statement in the letter to an abortion clinic physician that an unidentified someone might place explosives under the car. And the district court said that was not a true threat. And the circuit court said, guess again, <laughs> it is. Because although it might have been an ambiguous statement, there was enough in terms of the direct statement of personal intent. So that's one example. Another one with is with regard to um, a formal, uh, a different, different set of circumstances, obviously, but involving university letter sent to a former, by a former doctoral student to, um, to the university board that said, bullets are far cheaper and much more decisive than legal action. And a person with my meager means and abilities can stand at a distance of two football fields and end elements of longstanding dispute with the switch of my index finger. So the court, and again, this is 2007, Fourth Circuit said, clearly threatening language. So, so the court it, you know, lives in this world. I mean, whatever circuit court it is, it lives in this world. And I think, so the point about Jews will not replace us, frankly, in and of itself, without any other circumstances, if I were asked to, again, in a pure vacuum, I would say, you know, that's, that's not breach of peace. It's unpleasant, it's ugly, <laughs> but it is not breach of peace. On the other hand, if you had circumstances like some of the ones I've just identified, then, then I think that would clearly inform the situation. Uh, here's a similar one. Does Kanye West's uh, message of death con to Jews constitute incitement to violence? Yes, that's a fact-specific inquiry, right? I mean, I went back to the same hypothetical. If he's speaking to a group of torchbearers outside a synagogue, yes. Uh, if he's, uh, you know, mouthing off on social media, we haven't we haven't reached that yet. Part part of the problem again is also to whom is a statement being made. So, for example, I had indicated earlier that I've been threatened for 40 years, and there's one person who says not until there are. 20 Jewish robes floating down the Farmington River, will he be happy, mm. as an example? Um, telling me that sleeper cells are being reawakened to visit me. Putting out personal address information. Now, and, and when new judges are appointment, new, generally Jewish, but not exclusively, he tells his readers what weapons to use and where people live. So, let me ask you this question. This is an objective person. So the fact that I have you know, attack dogs or I think I'm a tough guy and I don't go out and retaliate or have call police at every instance of every time I get one of these hate missives, is that the test or is what a normal person in my circumstances who is being called upon to really examine this, that's really the test. So each one of these cases, and I use this as an example, because they really are so fact specific. I mean, I got threats one day from one guy and I found out, and by the way, it was somebody I represented as a public defender, mm. whose case I won. And I thought, wait a minute, I won your case. Why didn't you threaten my partner? <laughs> he lost your other appeal. <laughs> I, and I realized, so I called the US attorney and I said, where's this joker? He's in prison. Okay, he's in federal prison. When's he due? He's, he's going to be there for 20 years. So I said, all right, I'm not going to worry. I said, but tell me what's going on. Well, he had threatened the president, and so, you know, he obviously was being looked into. 
I bring this up because then the question is, okay, so what's he doing? What, what is this really about? He's looking to get arrested, so he's gonna be brought to court so that he can, and it's state proceedings, so that he can then escape. So I said, well, he's not gonna use me to, to be the vehicle for this, so I'm sorry, you're just gonna have to do your federal time. But you know, th what happens, and I think this is sort of part of the, uh, the problem with police officers, is you become immune to this. And that's why we really are not the, the arbiters. So when I put my hat on and I decide legally, and, or did as a Supreme Court justice, what's breach of peace, what's threatening, what's incitement, what's public disturbance, it can't be through my lens. I grew up in Crown Heights. I ride subways at three in the morning. It's not, but it's not through my lens. It's what an objective person under normal circumstances should have to tolerate. So, so really, the, you know, and that's why I think there's no pat answer. There's no clear fighting words. Everything is contextual, which brings me back to my first point about really everything is a balance. And Frankly, I think that's where it should be. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Please join me in thanking these wonderful speakers. And, and don't forget to sign out if you need CLE credit. Thank you.